So, welcome to everybody and uh, welcome to Professor Phil McCann. I'm very happy and also honored to have him here. A very short introduction of Phil. He holds the University of Groningen Endowed Chair of Economic Geography and he is the special advisor to Johannes Hahn, the European Commissioner for Regional Policy. He has been working uh, uh, alongside the special advisor Fabrizio Barca that is now re appointed cabinet minister in the new Italian government. So he is the only special advisor of the commissioner at the moment. And he is also adjunct professor of economics at the University of Waikato, New Zealand and formerly professor of urban regional economics at the University of Reading. In 2011, was also appointed as a commissioner for the Northern Economic Future Commission that is tasked to articulate a 10 year strategy for economic growth uh, across the three northern regions in the UK and uh, has been a guest professor in a number of countries. I cannot list all of them, US, Japan, Thailand, Italy, and so on. Has an impressive list of publications that I won't go through because we have a limited amount of time. And I am particularly happy to welcome Phil here because as I said to my students, I mean, this is a very difficult moment, particularly for those of us who are teaching uh, integra European integration right now. I mean, European development policies have been, have evolved over time from a very minor and chaotic uh, policy in the 80s uh, to arguably uh, the most important policy in the European Union. Over time, and particularly after the uh, uh, enlargements, the recent enlargement that brought the European Union from 15 members to 27, there was an, a, a political awareness increasingly uh, putting at the center of the EU agenda uh, uh, the reorientation, uh, monitoring, evaluation of its equity issue and put European citizen at the core of Europe. However, on the other hand, there has been also increasing pressure to redirect the cohesion policy towards sectoral policies, and the current crisis has not helped at all, has created a mood for rigor, sanctions, and, I mean, an increasing emphasis on efficiency or actually lack of efficiency uh, 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 of the European construction. So I had very hard time in trying to transmit to the students that I'm very happy to see some of them here to convince them that there is a big project behind the European Union as it is today in a moment of increasing Euro skepticism and even a Eurosclerosis that in, in fact goes even beyond that of the 70s. Therefore, it is very important to understand the way forward of Europe 2020 and its strategy for a smart, sustainable, and inclusive growth. So we hope that you know, more notes of hopes and enthusiasm will come today from the talk to of Phil. Philip, I leave you. Yeah. About an hour? Less than an hour. Less than okay, hour. so I'll take my watch off. Could you just, I'll, could you kind of interrupt me when there's about 20 minutes? 15 minutes left, okay. okay. So, well, the first thing I, I, I'd like to say is I, I'm delighted to be here. Um, I have so many long-standing and ongoing contacts. Can you hear me okay? 
I have so many long-standing and ongoing contacts with, uh, with LIC, and in particular the Department of Geography and Environment, but also with economics and other departments. And so many of the people who have heavily influenced how I think about things over the years, and still do, are people who are here. We've all come through myriad different routes to get here, but Simona, Ian Gordon, Paul Cheshire, Henry Overman, Andres Rodriguez Pose, Michael Storper, many, many people. Tony Venables used to be in economics, obviously. These are people who've had a huge influence on how I think about stuff. And the things I'm going to try and talk to you about today, what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk, and I'm going to say a lot of stuff. And then at the end, obviously, I'm happy to open it to, to questions, and I'll do the best I can to answer them. But the reform process that's taking place is an enormous undertaking. It's not just in terms of the, the sums of money involved, it's the context. So what I'm going to try and do is I'm going to try and put a bit of an architecture onto this whole problem. I'm going to do it this way. It's about redesigning the world's largest development policy. Well, it depends what you mean by the largest development policy in the world. It's probably the largest in the world with a, a comprehensive, more or less unified architecture. U.S. development policy in aggregate would be larger, uh, at least in terms of the Barker Report calculations, although the Barker Report didn't include the additional domestic funding involved. So they're probably fairly comparable on average. But the U.S. case is about 180 sectoral policies. In terms of a single architecture, this is probably the largest single uh, development policy in the world. And also I was asked to give a catchy title to ensure that people came, so that's why I, I called it that. But this is a large undertaking and it has consequences. And it's, it's a story also of our times. What I'm going to do is I'm going to start off by explaining what's happened and what's happening. That's the first part. And then what I'll try and do is to move away from the policy issues and I'll try and put a context on this. It's all to do with what's happened in the last 20 years. Globalization, all the stuff that you, you teach, you learn at LSE, you exchange ideas about. It's, it's the context of all that is what has forced a change of thinking. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the debates. Now, of course, in one sense, they're academic debates, but they're much more than that. They're about real decisions that people have to make. And I'm going to talk about what's called the space buying versus the place-based approach. And then I'm going to talk about the policy debates as they pertain specifically to the European Union context, which is a particular context. And then I'm going to explain how it's shifting to what we call a results-oriented policy. Now, then I'm going to take a sidestep. Many of you who are studying here will know a lot of the debates through journals and textbooks and all that stuff. Actually, what's happening out there is actually a little bit different to what most people realize in terms of the actual context on the ground. So I'm going to try to give you a feel for that. And so maybe shift our thinking a little bit. And then I'll, I'll come back to the context at the regional level in Europe and also the urban issue, because also these are things that people here are discussing about. And then finally, I'll just make a few context uh, on the UK context. I'll just make a few comments, kind of link the two issues. OK, here we go. Or maybe here we don't go. OK. The 1970s, 1980s, regional policy was primarily a compensation scheme for the donor countries. That's broadly the background to it. 1988, we had the, uh, the Delors reform of European regional policy. And this was really in response to the accession of Spain, Portugal, and Greece in the 1980s. Because, of course, your large companies are coming, uh, countries are coming in, but their GDPs on average were lower. So there had to be a rethinking of the policy. And the policy was conceived of at the time as a cohesion policy. And the language is important in here because we're talking about, it's a question of terminology. We're talking about the, the advent of the European single market. And that was the kind of shift of thinking that was taking place in Europe. So rethinking about regional policy in terms of this cohesion agenda. So the focus was on single market that came shortly afterwards, European Union integration and so on. The policy that we have today basically in general has the same architecture as then. It's had about three reforms. It depends how you define these things. But broadly, it's the same architecture. Now, that's important because, of course, all policies do have an architecture. And that's part of the issue. Over the decades, there has been a shift of priorities towards poorer countries. In 1989, about 56% of resources were allocated to the poorest regions and countries. But, of course, you're not even talking about the EU 15 then. You're talking about oh. EU 12. The lagging regions of the EU15 were the major recipients of the funding streams between 2000 and 2006, 
Whereas today what we've got is the new member states account for about 21% of the EU27 uh, population, but about 52% of the cohesion policy uh, expenditure. That's the current programming period 2007-2013. So you can see there's a shift, but of course that shift itself mirrors the shift in the European Union in terms of the architecture, the membership uh, of the European Union itself. What are the kind of themes, the kind of principles going back to the Delors reform, the, the kind of drive the thinking and the logic of cohesion policy. Well, we have what we call objective regions. That's the issue of prioritization. Where does funding, where, where's the concentration focused geographically? Regions have different object levels. Issues of planning are important, submissions of planning, having a, a structure to what we're doing. Partnership, that's also one of the key themes. And many of you studying things like local economic development will be familiar with these types of themes. The compatibility of policies. Clearly you need policies to work together as much as possible. Also domestic versus the, the European funding. A concentration of resources. We know that these things are important. Coordination of instruments. Additionality. The idea is you want to have policy that you think is going to do something that otherwise wouldn't have taken place. And broadly, the architecture in the current sense of three phases, 1988 to 1999, 2000 to 2006, which was the previous programming period, and now 2007 to 2013. The next programming period is 2014 to 2020. And that's when everything is going to change. In order to understand the change, let's think a little bit about how these things have evolved. 1988 to 1999, the Objective 1 regions, many of you are familiar with this stuff, you had Objective 1 regions, uh, structurally backward regions, that was the kind of uh, the context. Objective 2 regions were regions uh, facing severe industrial decline, structural transformation and so on. 2000 to 2006, Objective 1 regions at the Nuts 2 level were regions with 75% or less of the European Union average. Um, but the objective now is to counter lagging development, whereas the objective two regions, sorry, the objective one region, the objective two regions uh, were regions undergoing economic and social conversion. So there's a different way of kind of defining these at the Nuts 3 level, Nuts 2 level. But you can see there's a slight change in language here, and this is important. If you don't mind, I'm going to put my glasses on. My eyes are a little bit tired. There's also the objective three region status, which is on training systems and employment. And different... Um, Different policies, uh, streams, funding streams, are focused on different issues. Um, Interreg. Many of you are familiar with Interreg. The kind of cross-border coordination issues. Uh, there was the urban initiatives, urban, uh, urban two, urbact, equal, uh, which is the employment leader, rural development, and so on, and fishing. There was an architecture here. That you have different streams, different funding streams, kind of different categories of places. 2007 to 2013, which is the current programming period, there's basically three objectives and three financial instruments. There's the convergence objective, which is ERDF, European Regional Development Fund. There's ESF, which is the uh, Employment Fund, and the Cohesion Fund, which is to help countries that, for where these things have a big shock effect on the country, how to kind of cope with the transition. And the other objective area is competitiveness and employment objective, and that uses uh, that runs with both the RDF funding and also ESF funding. There's also the European Territorial Cooperation, Interreg 3, and so on. In a sense, what we've got is a shift of thinking. We started off, if I just jump back, structurally backward, industrial decline. Just think about the terminology, the discourses here. Shifting to countering lagging development promoting competitiveness and employment, training systems. Now it's convergence objective. This is 2007 onwards. This is the language that comes out of the, the relaunch Lisbon strategy. And those of you who are doing economic geography, Barrow, Sully, Martin, you know all about the convergence type story. Competitiveness and employment. And of course we've got urban issues coming in now for the first time as, as, a, as a distinct category in some sense. What we've got is a shift of Slight shift of structure, so the leader program, uh, European Agricultural Guidance Fund, uh, becomes the European Fund for Rural Development, the Fisheries Fund, and so on. They, they, have a, they now have a separate legal architecture under the current uh, programming framework. But the point is that looking over the decades, you do see a shift of emphasis from countering, lagging, and backward to promoting, pushing forward. 
And it's not just terminology. It does reflect changes in thinking, in terms of, in the academic world, how we think. I mean, the last 20 years, as we know, in economic geography, spatial economics, there is a, is a different world to when I was a student. It's incredible what's, what's happened. And LSE has been at the forefront of that, internationally. European Union cohesion policy now accounts for about 35% of the total European Union budget. So it's one of the two major funds of the European Union. The, more or less, the common agricultural policy and cohesion policy are more or less pretty much the same size. And they are by far the biggest elements of European Union funding. So this is the context. Now, the policy has a legal foundation. And this is really important to understand. I've heard sometimes people say, oh, just, just close the whole thing down. Lisbon Treaty, Article 3, the third indent, the Treaty of the European Union states that the Union shall promote economic, social, and territorial cohesion and solidarity amongst the member states. And Article 2C of the Treaty of the Functioning of the European Union provides that shared competences between the Union and the member states applies in economic, social, and territorial cohesion. It's a core part of the European context. Why? Because we have a single market. And single markets have consequences. And you have to find ways to allow places to adjust as best as possible to those consequences. A market where the same people always win is not really a market. It doesn't help the European Union on any dimension. So you can see there is a legal basis of this as well as a theoretical and analytical basis. The language now, European Union regional policy is an investment policy. It supports job creation, competitiveness, economic growth, improved quality of life, and sustainable development. These investments support the delivery of the Europe 2020 strategy. This is on the European Union website today. Once again, you can see there's been a movement in language and thinking. Think about the architecture of the last 20 or so years. Look at where we are now. It's much more of a forward-looking agenda. And it's a much more comprehensive agenda. It's talking about quality of life, sustainability. In there, while we're talking about investment, economic uh, uh, growth, jobs, it's all part of a common discourse. And the common discourse is framed in what is called the Europe 2020 strategy. The Europe 2020 strategy was first published in March 2010. European strategy for smart, sustainable, and inclusive growth. And all European policies, including things like uh, framework funding for research and development, are going to be constructed under the auspices of the Europe 2020 strategy. Smart growth. Improving the conditions for innovation, research and development, improving education levels. These are the themes within the smart growth agenda. Sustainable growth, meeting climate change and energy objectives. Inclusive growth promoting employment, promoting social inclusion, and in particular through the reduction of poverty. Now, Europe 2020 is not a shopping list. That's not what it's about. It's not, okay, we'll do the, the smart growth stuff and you guys can do the inclusive growth stuff. Those over there can do the sustainable environmental stuff. That's not what Europe 2020 is about. It's really about trying to think how growth and development operates and functions and takes place in an integrated manner and trying to understand ways of thinking about policies to respond to the integrated nature of those issues. Now this is not Brussels speak. The Europe 2020 agenda, smart growth, sustainable growth and inclusive growth. The OECD growth strategy, stronger, cleaner, fairer. The US government growth strategy, sustainable innovation revitalization. They're not branding issues. They're not marketing issues. Clearly, they're designed to capture people's attention. But there's a real issue here. Talking to colleagues at the OECD, I do a lot of work nowadays with the OECD. The starting point of the OECD environment, we all face the consequences of this. These are externality issues. And we're all part of the causes of it. We're all part of the causes and the consequences. And all aspects of growth have all of these aspects to their nature. It's not just GDP per capita and that's the end of the growth story. That's part of the growth story, a critical part of the growth story. But growth, we understand now, is a much more comprehensive phenomenon. Growth and development are multidimensional, 
always. And how to think about that. There's a common convergence in thinking that's taking place across many big institutional organizations, different governments, and so on. So this is the context. You can see the thinking in terms of the language. And you can think of this at a, a national scale or at a European-wide scale. You can think about your own cities, your own neighborhoods, your own communities, your own workplaces. We all travel to work. That has environmental consequences. We have real estate issues. That affects innovation. It's not just a housing issue because most people start a business by borrowing on the basis of their housing equity. Education matters, but we pay taxes for that. All of these things are integrated. Skills matter, but skills is not just for the highly skilled. Critical are middle skills and also lower skills. It's a hierarchy of how these things take place, which is what growth is about and development. So this is very much the thinking. October the 6th, 2011, was a watershed. The proposals for the new cohesion policy regulation, the Common Strategic Framework, the European Regional Development Fund, the European Social Fund, the Cohesion Fund, the European Agricultural Fund for Rural Development, and the European Maritime and Fisheries Fund. The proposals are regarding the new multi-annual financial framework of the European Union. The European Union budget and how those funds are used. And what are they used for? Well, look at the language here. This is the official uh, language. All of those funds are in together. What is important is the common strategic framework, is this idea of integration, precisely for the issues that we're talking about. All aspects of growth and development have this multidimensional nature to it. And this is the new proposal. I don't know if anyone here has read the proposals. There's two documents for the ESF and for the ERDF and the Cohesion Fund. You know, it's a good 300 pages of, of uh, legal type material. You know, I've read it, of course. I have to read this stuff. Um, but it's, it's something which is real. Cohesion policy in the new programming framework, the allocation is 376 billion euros. That's kind of a lot of money. That includes 40 billion for the Connecting Europe facility, which is the idea of trans-European integration of transport networks, energy networks, and so on. What are the themes of the reform? Well, alignment with the Europe 2020 objectives. Thematic concentration. A limited member menu of priorities. You can't do all things in all places. You have to prioritize. A results and performance oriented policy. Genuinely for the first time. The importance of multi-level governance reforms. Many people in LSE have been right at the forefront of this over the last 20 years. We understand increasingly that governance issues are central to development. Even the, I saw the article a couple of weeks ago by Sir Gus O'Donnell, I think it was in the Telegraph, saying exactly that. Governance itself and government has to be a driver for innovation. The European Social Fund, for the first time, at least 25% of the cohesion policy envelope, the Commission are looking at uh, minimum shares in each category, but the idea is pulling these funds, these sources of funding together to encourage and foster multidimensional type of thinking. There's also a shift in terms of increased funding for poorer regions, so that's increased by about 30% of the priority on helping the poorer regions of the EU12 particularly. Because, of course, many of those regions are the most vulnerable to the kind of things we're talking about. Out-migration. Out-migration in many parts of Central Europe is primarily younger people and highly skilled. You have very, very difficult labor market issues. You have problems of aging. Because, of course, as younger people leave, the demographic structure is accelerating much quicker. Also, many of those regions are, are, are very vulnerable. If you look at the, the cohesion documents, you can see this. The vulnerability indices by regions are very real. So it's, it's basically there's a shift in priorities. And also because as, as 
we do have some sort of convergence process in Europe. We know this. The poorer regions of poorer countries are, in some sense, catching. There's no question. It just depends who you are and where you are. But broadly, we see this. But of course, you've got a transition process. Think regions are on the move. And so also to have the categorization of regions is going to have a different category, which is the transition regions. It was basically 75% or below were the objective one regions. That's still there. They're the less developed regions. But we, we're going to have a new transition category, which is the 75 to 90 percent. These are the regions which are moving out. What you don't want is regions to move out of the lower category and then suddenly stop, and in particular with the financial crisis now. You want to keep that momentum going. And then obviously the more development region, developed regions are the ones with the GDP per head of more than 90 percent of the EU average. The emphasis will be on a place-based territorial approach, an integrated approach in which you're trying to design a provision of public goods which are tailored as best as possible to the local context. And that is going to be the approach. That implies vertical and horizontal multi-level governance, rethinking, reform, innovation in many cases, to break across silos of jurisdictional policy coordination and delivery. And the silos is actually the word the US government uses as the President's Council of Economic Advisers and the Office of Management and Budget, how essential it is increasingly to work across traditional silos because growth and development issues are not constrained to a particular department or division. In the European Union case, there'll be what we call partnership contracts, partnership investment and development partnership contracts, a new <coughs> linking mechanism between the Member States and the European Commission. There will also be an increased urban emphasis parallels some of the discussions within the UK. And uh, you know, I'm aware that this is a big agenda for many people at LSE. There will also be the use of what are called conditionalities and results and outcome indicators. And this is all stated explicitly in the architecture of the reforms. The discussions are expected to focus on the central themes of strategic programming and thematic concentration. Both with a view to ensuring closer alignment of the cohesion policy with the goals of Europe 2020 strategy. The regulations will have to be adopted by the end of 2012. This is the European Union, this is on the, uh, the European Commission website, to allow the new programming of the policy to get underway in time to start at the end of 2013, beginning of 2014. That's less than two years away. That's not a long time at all. Because this is a change in thinking. And on the part of people involved in development policy, this also requires a big change in thinking. So I do a lot of talks around Europe. These are not my ideas. I'm an advisor to the Commission, yes, but there's hundreds of people involved in this. But one of the things I do do is I do a lot of talks because it's important to communicate what is happening and what is going to be happening to get policymakers thinking. And actually, many, many policymakers are starting to move very quickly and not always in the regions you would expect, which is interesting. Why is all this taking place? What's the background? Institutional changes. The world changed between 1988 and 1994. 1988, we had the new constitution in Brazil. 1989, uh, Tiananmen Square, China started to open up uh, dramatically. 1989, the Berlin Wall came down. 1990, Mandela came out. 1991, the second industrial reforms, both in India and in Indonesia. 1994 was the North American Free Trade Agreement. 1994 was the new currency in uh, the real in Brazil. 1991 was the European single market. And 1991 was the invention of the World Wide Web. A third of the world's labor market appeared overnight. Globalization has been taking place since the early 1600s, or early 1500s, it depends how you want to think about it. But modern globalization is basically two decades old. And the transformation was gigantic. Things that we think about, we take for granted. ICT, technological advances, super sophisticated roll-on, roll-off type techniques, mobile phones, the internet, commercial air, you know, fly-by-wire, all this kind of stuff. We don't think about it. It's so normal. Enormous growth in multinationals, outsourcing, offshoring, enormous growth in the number of double taxation treaties, bilateral investment treaties. What are the effects of all of this? Well, broadly, slow international convergence. We know that except Africa as a continent. There's a small number of countries in Africa which are converging, but a large part of Africa are not. But the rest of the world, we do broadly see slow convergence. What we do see is in most countries, increasing intranational, interregional divergence. 
Not in every country, but in many countries, we've seen that through the 1990s, nearly 2000s. We've also seen that this formation of broadly what we call global regionalism, these big blocks, South and East Asia, the European Union, North American Free Trade Agreement, that on many, many economic indicators, capital investment, uh, investment shares, employment, and so on, many, many different indicators, that those areas become more integrated within themselves. I think... Uh, the number's about 70% um, on average. A typical multinational has about 70% of most of its activities defined on any dimension within that same trade block from which it emerges. So it's not globalization, it's global regionalism, or regionalization, global regionalization. One of the other phenomena that we're also aware of, and particularly LSA have been at the forefront in documenting this, in the 1990s there was the increasing role of cities again, particularly the global city type agenda. It's not just marketing speak. This is real. So many numbers have, have, have indicated this. 1990s cities in growth. Ed Glaser, cities are back. 1990s, we saw you know, higher productivity levels, many different indicators of knowledge outcomes, such as patents, innovations, copyrights, licenses, higher human capital indices, both in terms of knowledge inflows, and also stocks of human capital, particularly university human capital, indicators of entrepreneurship, and so on. Cities seem to be leading the charge in the new globalization context. So you had this globalization shock, the world opened up, you had this formation of these large integrated blocks, and at the center of those, driving those, were city regions, with, all, with the businesses in those places at the forefront of those globalization, regionalization pro processes. That's the kind of story that we're familiar with in terms of our material. Of course, the strange thing is, many people say, why would that be the case when we've got the internet and open borders? Precisely when the world should be coming flat, according to Thomas Friedman, what we say is that's not what happened. What we've had is this kind of spikiness. Well, basically what's happened is, imagine spatial transactions cost, the cost of doing business across geography for routinized activities, anything you can design a template or, a pro or um, some sort of uh, blueprint, those can go down a wire quicker than ever. Whereas for many non-routine activities, knowledge-intensive activities, which are becoming more non-standardized, then they, the cost of doing those over business, uh, business of, of those types of activities across space have actually increased in many ways. And there's a lot of data on this. So what you get is a bifurcation type of problem. So standard little urban economics type trick for those of you who are doing graduate stuff in this. Three spiky diagrams. Mills, Muth, Alonzo type spikes, big city, medium city, big city. The center is the service type knowledge face-to-face -face activities. The ones on the edge are the more kind of logistics distribution. What we have is the, the thick line is the envelope of the bid rent, care, uh, bid rent curve. Some, some of you I know have to pull this out the back of your mind. But those of you who are studying this kind of stuff, if you get decreasing for standardized activities, decreasing transactions costs, increasing for non-standardized, what you get is that. As Richard Florida said, the world is not becoming flatter, it's becoming more spiky. And what we know from urban economics is these diagrams, they're only a textbook trick, but they're very close to the empirical realities. What we do know is these spikes represent population density per square meter. That's the Alonzo substitution argument. Population density per square meter, very, very closely, they also reflect wages and land prices per square meter, and therefore productivity per square meter. There's a little bit of a substitution twist on that argument, but basically that's what these spikes represent. Productivity per square meter, density per square meter, and wage and land prices per square meter. People say, yes, I don't believe the world is spiky. That's population density and output per square meter in North America, South America, Africa, the world's most urbanized country on many indicators. China, and of course the one I'm most interested in, which is here. So the world is suddenly a very interesting place. It always was interesting, but I would say from economic geographers and spatial economists, it's never been more interesting. It's also very complex, and it's new. Okay, in terms of debates, a big impact was the World Development Report of 2009, reshaping economic geography. I know many of the LSE students here uh, are very familiar with this. The argument was what's called a space-blind approach, basically providing institutions, integration, infrastructure, let the market work. You know the kind of stories. The, the kind of countries, I guess, the World Bank was thinking of were basically BRICS-type countries. That was the real story, plus some of the Central and Eastern European countries. 
the focus of the report was primarily on kind of efficiency, but not on distributional issues particularly. And it was kind of a mixture of new economic geography and urban economics, but you don't actually need NEG to sell those stories. Bortz and Stein from 1964 will give you exactly the same argument. What's important about that report? I would say what's the most important is it says that geography matters. It's not just institutions. Of course, the World Bank position for many years has been institutions or everything. Whereas this says really geography does matter on a fundamental basis. It's not a, a, an add-on. Home market effects and agglomeration are critical for growth. And it's a counterpoint to the small, many of the popular small country arguments. But of course, the correct geography is required. You need the right factors doing the right things in the right places. How do you get to that point? How do you achieve this? And the space neutral argument was basically let factors move. Just let people move, liberalize, deregulate, and let people move. And primarily the story was about big cities, in some cases, often mega cities. That was the kind of story, this, the context. The emphasis was on agglomeration. And in a sense, the failure of the, the very minimalist institutional arguments, because many of the countries it was talking about, you know, it's almost very impossible at times to see how any of the institutions can be reformed. But when we talk about things like policy neutrality, space neutral or place, uh, space blind, you, you, the question is, is it a question of intent or outcomes? Is the intention to be neutral or are the outcomes neutral? Because, of course, in the end, all policy involves decisions, private sector actors, public sector actors, civil society actors, and how they interact. In the end, people make decisions. Who decides on what and where and how? And a lot of these arguments we know are about elites, monopoly, monopoly, and monopsony positions. That's not just in a story in a transition or a development country. That's just as powerful in very rich countries. And often capital city elites are very, very important here. An earlier World Development Report commented on precisely that. Uh, the paper by Kim in the OECD Regional Outlook that came out last month is very, very good on that. Henderson's paper in the Journal of Regional Science in 2010. The point is that institutions and decision making really do matter, but where, when, why, and how they matter is a much more complex issue. Where, when, and how. Think about a sector policy. You could have innovation, aerospace, biosciences, whatever. The intention is on increasing innovation technology, but the outcomes are going to be space-specific depending on where actors are and where the mechanics of the industry work. The outcomes depend on the behavioral responses. Therefore, a completely space-neutral, sector-neutral policy is never sufficient as a growth policy because it's a more complex phenomenon of its own right. You have to think also in terms of counterfactuals. You've got to think about geography because it's part of the story. So the place-based response it says that policy really matters. It's not a marginal add-on. It really matters. And that purely neutral policies are never, never alone sufficient to talk about growth. You've got to think about interdependencies, intra and inter, between sectors and between places. Where does all this come from? It comes from a series of reports that came out 2009-2010. The OECD Regional Outlook, the CAF report, Andres rodriguez Posse, I think, was involved with. Regions Matter, how regions grow to fantastic OECD reports that just looked at the data. And the Barker report. The US government more recently has been extremely explicit on these issues. Very, very forward-looking. And I'll leave all the references for people to follow this up. Regional policies, it used to be understood, was basically a sectoral policy. It was a hierarchical architecture. Top down, you kind of move things around. Subsidies, state aids, administrative units, central government tells kind of everyone what to do, and you move stuff around. Whereas modern thinking about development policy is very much the place-based approach advocated by those reports. No, functional economic areas. Think about what are the right geographies. Think about integrated development projects. Not a, not a sectoral one or the other. Think about how these things fit together. Think about Europe 2020. Mix of soft and hard capital. Building roads is very important, but there are other forms of investment which are just as critical. Labor, innovation issues, and so on. You have to think about different levels of government because governance issues, to get the right policies in the right geography, requires rethinking the governance relationships horizontally across jurisdictions and vertically between tiers of government. And what's the focus? The focus is on tapping underutilized potential. That's the argument. If there are resources which are place-specific, which are not fundamentally mobile, how do you get people to use those resources to the best of their ability? It's not about making everything equal. That's not what the issue is. 
Modern place-based building thinks exp builds explicitly on institutional arguments and social capital arguments. It's not geography versus institutions, it's how they fit together. Why? Because we all function in places, all aspects of our economy, including policy and governance. People policies, place policies, always overlap. They interact, they complement. And perceptions about place really do matter. What local people think really does matter in terms of the vitality of the place. The European case, the European Union, is very different to the World Development Report types of regions in general. The context, we do have a single market with a legal architecture. There are winners and losers within countries and between countries. But we do have these legal principles, social cohesion, territorial cohesion, as we've seen in the treaties. If you want to foster institutional reform, sector policies alone are never going to do that across Europe. And particularly if you're thinking in terms of lines with the Europe 2020 report. Now this had a, a very important, about 15 minutes. 15 minutes, fine. This had a very important start, the Sapir report many of you will be familiar with, focused on promoting labor mobility, infrastructure innovation, a convergence fund, give it to the low, low income countries, don't think about the regional issue, foster institutions and so on. The problem is how do you do it? How do you extract the expertise? How do you get the right incentives to get the right elites? In the sector policy in the Sapir report, actually the more you really realize it's impossible to do it. And this is one of the key issues of the Bark Report. Sector policies always face the problem, problem of capture. Rent-seeking elites, you've got to get round, you've got to build with people, build on the knowledge, but do it in a way which is for the public and the common good. You've got to link outcomes to policies. You've got to have a sense of where you're going. And the kind of superior report approach, the institutional reforms, there's none of that really in there. And there's no rule for dealing with these kind of uh, issues. 2008, Danuta Hubner, the then Commissioner for Regional Policy, decided to organize a commission, a set of hearings of many, many international experts. Why do we have a policy? Should we have a policy? If we do have a policy, what should it look like? Why? In response to all the globalization changes and all these issues about how to drive reform institutional in different places. The Barker, report said, the Barker report said, well, there were weaknesses in the existing system, the current architecture, there was a deficit in strategic planning, there was no real territorial perspective, there was a lack of focus, there was a failure to distinguish between efficiency and social inclusion objectives, there was a failure of the need of contractual arrangements, there was a lack of information provision, little use of any of the available data, lack of evaluation except ex post, and there was no consideration of the broader well-being issues as of in the Stiglitz-Sen Fatusi Commission. So the place-based argument that was advocated by Barker was we need to take account of all these spatial issues, move away from convergence discussions, it's too far removed from the policy, and focus on adjustment and transformation. Explicitly consider everything we know about economic geography and spatial economics. Build it in to how we think about the policy. But transfer the onus of responsibility to local stakeholders as much as possible, and the policy designers. Why? Because they're best placed to identify bottlenecks and missing links. They know the context. But you need to do it in a way that extracts their knowledge, builds on it, but does it in a way that you don't get monopsony, monopoly problems. So how do you design multi-level governance relationships to do that when Europe is so heterogeneous? The way you do it is you need to find ways to measure impacts, outcomes. The policy credibility rests on this. And the argument of, of the Barker Commission was that the place-based approach is the right way forward. Shift the policy away from expenditure, financial assessment, which the policy is very well, it's very, very comprehensive on that, but focus on a policy which is all about policy intentions. What are you trying to do? What particular aspect of the well-being of the community are you trying to influence and why? What's the priority in your place? And use results and outcomes indicators. This is all straight out of the Stiglitz and Fatuci Commission on the measurement of economic performance and, and uh, well-being. Also, it's consistent with the OECD Global Project on measuring progress, the French-German Council of Economic Advisors, also the Atkinson Review on the measurement of government output. So, what do we want? We want a policy which is place-based for local design, control, legitimacy, builds on local capabilities, but in order to do that, you have to define what are called conditionalities which are reasonable, feasible, just, and enforceable. This is Amartya Sen, that kind of thinking. But it actually goes back to the World Bank. The 1980s and the 1990s, the World Bank and the IMF started all of the arguments about conditionalities. 
use results impact, uh, results and outcome indicators to allow for evaluation and assessment and also to drive institutional innovation. This is a, one of the conditionalities now in the new regulations. That all regions programs have to produce a multi-annual plan for timely connection of data that you can aggregate, that you can build on. All projects have to be ge data generating exercises, qualitative and quantitative. Why? Because you need to have some sort of outcome indicators in order to understand what you're trying to do. Inputs are the money that goes into the project, output are the number of roads you build or whatever, but you need to do it in a way that, that captures the specific dimension of what you're trying to do. What is it you're trying to capture? The, the idea of the policy is not to build another kilometre of road, it's to increase transport efficiency, it's to reduce any energy consumption, it's to pro, uh, provide a more integrated system of mobility. That's what the outcome, the result is about. So you need to choose outcomes. I'm going to leave all these on the website so people can follow through. But you need to select indicators and sets of indicators which best capture what the policies are trying to achieve. And of course, they're going to be different in different places. I'll jump ahead again. Inputs to outputs to outcomes. And the impact is how far you make progress towards the desired outcome. And the policies are going to be required to set these up ex ante. In other words, to make the, ex the intentions of the policies clear from the start. And then to monitor the progress as you go along. How far are we making progress here? Data can be collected at the program level or the embedded projects. In principle, every project should itself be a data generating exercise. Why? Because you need the data in order to evaluate what you're doing, whether the, it's going well or badly. Is it going as expected or not? Otherwise, there's no way you can learn. The policymakers must decide the priority. That's Stiglitz and Fatusi. But some policies can be aimed at more than one outcome. For an example, an urban regeneration plan might be aimed at improving innovation through the effect on the housing market, but also not aggravating access to work or improving air quality. You can think about plans like this, but the point is to make these things explicit, what you're trying to do. Indicators can be qualitative or quantitative, ideally both. They can be metrics or they big things like performance story recording, which is a standard technique now in Australia. Powerful bags of indicators that capture the different dimensions. But why do we do all this? It's to promote learning, self-awareness, learning. Publicize the results, make it transparent, find out what everyone else is doing, what problems they're having, what problems you're having, what you tried, what you didn't try, why? Because you have to foster an awareness of the consequences of your actions and also identify things that you were previously not aware of. The goal is not to construct an encompassing indicator like a league table. It's not about that. It's about trying to get a dashboard that helps capture what you're trying to do. It's all about the intention of the policy. If you're spending money, why are you spending it? What are you trying to achieve? Countries, member states will be required to express those objectives in the programming documents. And in terms of the projects and the project, what is it they're trying to do? Why are you doing it that way? And obviously you need to have you know, some sort of clear-cut principles in terms of how you produce the data. It has to be you know, obviously regularly standardized, observable. Principles such as reasonable, normative, robust. I'll leave this all on the website. This is all straight out of Stiglitz Sen Fatusi. You need to have things that people can agree on, or at least say, I understand what you're trying to do. I can see what you're aiming at. Let's see how the program goes. Now, there are difficult issues. Sometimes outcomes and outputs are hard to distinguish. That's not a problem, though, because there is rigor in terms of this. There are principles, and I'll just show, there is a paper which is on the European Commission website and many people were involved in this, including people like Andres Rodriguez Pose, Attila Varga, Henry de Groot, big OECD team, Mark Partridge, Andre Bonacorosi, Ricardo Scarpa, Frank Van Clay. You know, it's a tremendous group of people working on this for over a year. So there are principles to focus on. But the Roderick quote is my favorite. You don't use outcome results indicators because you know the results of the outcomes. That's not the reason. It's to drive the policy process correctly. 
It's to make the intentions explicit from the start so everyone can help steer the program. You can see what we're doing. It's a social capital building argument. I've got about five minutes, have I? Something yes, like exactly. Five or ten minutes at the most? Okay. Seven minutes. Seven minutes, okay, good. Let me just shift to move away from the textbook view of the world that we have. Growth, there's no such thing as a typical region. The OECD data, regional outlook, is absolutely clear on this. Heterogeneity is the dominant characteristic of regions, not homogeneity, and that is true in every country. The OECD regional outlook. So when you lift a textbook model and you go to the real world, please treat it with care. This is important. Because growth is heterogeneous, it's different in different places. The policies, the programs, the results indicators are going to be different. And that's the nature of the European Union. The benefits of urban concentration are not linear, nor are they infinite. You've got some countries such as the USA, Korea, Japan, a much smaller level, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, but it's still very much the big city story. But for the rest of the OECD, that's not true anymore. The, the patterns of growth are not particularly different between rural, intermediate, or urban areas across the OECD. And actually, endogenous issues seem to dominate. I'm going to, I'm going to jump ahead to show you some figures, because I'm short of time. What these graphs show, this is the EU15, these are the Western European countries. The dark line are primarily urban regions. The perforated line are intermediate, small towns, rural areas all mixed in, commuting patterns and so on. And the, the grey line in the middle are primarily rural regions. What do we see? About 2002, the OECD switched. The OECD countries in Western Europe rather switched. They were dominated in the 90s by the big city story, is the textbook story. The first decade of globalization, absolutely. It was the big cities and the intermediate areas came catching up, overtook the rural areas. But after 2002, the OECD switched. If you do it on a two-year moving average, you see even more noticeably that that's the case. The big city agglomeration story has not been the growth story in Europe for nearly a decade. The political discourses are only starting to catch this up. Whereas if you look at the Central and Eastern European story, it is still primarily an urban issue. It's urban because you're still getting the rural, you know, rural migrants into Warsaw type phenomenon. But that's not the story in France or in any of the other, really any of the other Western European countries. So growth rates don't change. It's not a simple disequilibrium for those of you who've done urban economics. It's not a simple equilibrium or disequilibrium model of migration. It's extremely heterogeneous across different places. And this is a kind of a Zipps law diagram in growth rates. It's concave. If cities were more productive and the growth contribution was bigger for bigger cities, it would be convex. The curvature would be the other way. It's concave because most of the growth in Europe now is in the smaller and medium sized centers. That's across the OECD. This is all in the OECD region. So when we talk about cities in the European context, we have to be very careful. It's not all the good news story. It's also complex stories of cities. Why are we getting this spread effect? These are the places that are catching up. Well, there's evidence on broadband. This is just from the fifth cohesion report, so anyone can find this. Evidence of broadband spread is really happening. Access to schools and education. Rural areas are still struggling in many parts of Europe, but they are actually catching up from where, where they should be. Healthcare access, for example. We are getting spread effects. So the first decade of globalization was a concentration effect, and now it's starting to spread in many dimensions, including financial services. So what we see, when we talk about cities in Europe, it's not only the big city, fancy, consumer city type argument. That's true in some cities. Europe is much more complex than that. What do we see? The, GDP per cap, the G, total GDP of cities in Western Europe has only moved by 0.6% in the last decade. 0.6% in the last decade. Cities offer big problems as well because a lot of the middle skills, middle income jobs are hollowing out. They're the ones globalization going to places like China. So what you're getting is the bifurcation problem. Within cities, you're getting a separation between high income groups and low income groups and the middle group are the ones who are disappearing. People like Yanis Kaplanis, who was at LSE. Alan Manning has done a lot of work on these types of issues. This is what we're starting to see. Productivity levels across cities. These are metro, capital city, smaller city areas vary enormously across every European country. 
This is labour productivity per country. So in the middle is DE Germany. You see it's, it's very different. The UK, these are normalised to national productivity levels. It's a big differences between places. If you look in terms of changes in labour productivity, you also get a very messy picture. Different things are happening in different places. And there isn't a simple story. We know this from the OECD analyses of this. It's the same with population. There isn't a simple centre periphery, core periphery, disequilibrium model of migration. It's not the case. Europe is a, a real patchwork, and even within European countries. My final point for about two minutes. There are things happening in the UK. Now, I'm, I'm British, but I live outside. I've been living out, outside the UK for close to seven years now. And I've, you know, I've spent almost 10 years of my career living outside of the UK. But, you know, I, I'm keenly interested in what happens. I come back every couple of weeks, and I follow policy documents as much as I can. I try and keep in touch with policymakers and so on. The current programming period, there's 10.6 billion allocated to the UK over these 2007 to 2013. 2.9 billion is the convergence objective, 7 billion is on the competitiveness and employment objective. We've got 22 regional programs in the UK. Just reading the documents that are being published at the moment by um, BIS, Business Innovation and Skills, and the uh, CLG, Communities and Local Governments, and looking also at the documents in Scotland and Wales, there's actually a lot of commonalities between a lot of the discourses that are taking place in Britain and the discourses in Europe. So if I just flag up a few themes. Issues of rebalancing, the importance of places, integrated service delivery, appropriate geographies, and increasing urban emphasis. Not all good news story also facing real challenges. The role of LEPs and enterprise zones in the sense of trying to think about new ways forward. Okay, we've had enterprise zones before, but there, there are, you know, there is new thinking going on here. A core cities amendment to you know, maybe provide a, a general power of competence to, to city regions. We've got the regional growth fund, we've got the growing prices fund, and also the idea of tailored cities deals. Obviously, this is discussions within the UK. What I would like to communicate is that Many of these themes are exactly the same themes which are being discussed in other countries. Across the European case, the United States, very similar thinking. <coughs> now, of course, I'm just literally reading the documents and picking out language. But I have been surprised that there is a lot of commonalities in what's going on. Why is this taking place? The reforms to European cohesion policy really are happening. It is a change in the policy, it's a change in the logic, it's a change in the architecture, the programming. But it's not just that somebody in Brussels thought, let's just change the policy a bit. The reason the policy is changing is to try to build on new understandings of what we know about the relationship between institutions, governments, and, and places. Governance, institutions, and places. You have to work with people, you have to get coalitions across political boundaries, across institutional boundaries, across sectoral and professional boundaries. Why? Because we live in places, and places are multidimensional with all those actors in the community. How do you do it? The Barker report said the way you do it is you follow the arguments of people like Roderick, Asamoglu, Tabellini. I've just read Jeffrey Sachs's book, a wonderful book, The Price of Civilization. You could almost change the words United States and put the European Union. It's the same arguments. Multi-level governance reform, you know, general power of competence, these kind of things are exciting developments. It's going to be different in different countries, different solutions because there's different architecture, different institutions. But the point is we need to foster new concepts of partnership which are tailored to the context that implies governance innovation. As somebody once said to me, a civil servant has never been fired for, saving, for saying no. And I've always remembered that, of course, public governance officers carry tremendous responsibility. But governance innovation is just as important as private sector innovation. What does that imply? You have to try things. You have to experiment, the self-discovery argument of Hausmann and Roderick, and you have to allow things to fail, not to work. But how do people learn? By making it transparent. And this will be one of the themes of the new cohesion reforms, that all the policies, the implementations, the ex-ante outcome indicators, interim programming and evaluation, ex-post evaluation, is all going to be made public. Why? To focus attention to get people to be good citizens, to aim for the common good, and to share best practice. 
You have to share ideas and exchange them. There will be an increasing urban emphasis, and Commissioner Hahn's particular interest in that comes from the fact that many cities have not had the governance powers or flexibility that they require, this functional geography issue. It's not that it's all a good news story. It's you need to get the, the architecture right for the space and the places. So the urban issue in Europe is also very different to many of the textbook descriptions. It's a much more nuanced, much more subtle thing. And broadly, I would say, at least in terms of reading the documents as a British person who's an outsider, reading the policy statements, I find it very interesting because I think at least the language and the thinking behind it is very consistent with what's going on both at the level of the European Union and the OECD. So I'll stop there, shall I? Okay. Hi, um, my name's um, Chion Wara, and um, I'm the uh, Member of Parliament for Newcastle and also the Shadow Minister for uh, Innovation and Science. And one of the reasons I was here this evening is because I'm looking forward to working um, on the innovation policy uh, with Europe. Um, I was very interested by your talk. I found it um, very uh, incredibly relevant um, in many areas and um, I agree that um, all policy makers are looking to respond to um, consistent global factors. So I would be interested to know um, whether you see this government's uh, growth policy as being smart, sustainable and um, inclusive. Um, however, I, well, the question I wanted to ask you about was, was with regard to particularly a city like Newcastle. Because I think one thing you didn't really mention is that what we're seeing in the UK is a change in, if you like, the regional structures with the abolition of the regional development agencies and powers either being taken back to Whitehall or being given to the cities at the city level. But a city is not necessarily a functioning economic unit. And specifically in the, sake, in the case of Newcastle, um, it does not have the scale to compete at a city level. So how, what advice or uh, recommendations do you have, um, given the importance of, of uh, targets and um, performance measures uh, at a regional basis and the regional <coughs> emphasis both within the OECD and within Europe, what advice do you have for a city like U uh, Newcastle to uh, work effectively on a sustainable economic growth strategy with Europe? Yes. I think, uh, <coughs> I think, I think uh, hopefully you'll forgive me if I don't answer the first part of the question. I, I won't comment on the government's growth strategy because obviously as a private citizen I, we all have opinions, but because of my role in Europe I'll try and focus on, on the technical issue. I think it's a very important question because there is a very glib response that cities are the appropriate functional urban regions. You look at how people move, for example, travel to work patterns and things like that. And many people talk like that. But in terms of a policy, you go to the intention of the policy. What is it which is the intention? What's try, what is the aim? What's trying to be achieved? So for example, in the, the document on results outcome indicators, which is published on the European Commission website, there's lots of examples there of different types of results indicators you can think about. Um, so if you take some sort of technology policy, research and innovation, it's very unlikely that a research and innovation policy would be defined at a city level. It, it's very almost impossible to think of cases where that would be the case. Whereas, for example, a neighborhood regeneration scheme would be very much at a, a particular concentrated level. So the difficulty is different policies, different intentions require a different architecture depending on what you're trying to do. The previous system, at least in terms of the architecture of cohesion policy, really made no room or role for that kind of thinking. And the idea is to encourage that kind of thinking, to think about who would be the partners in the program of the policy appropriate for that level. The difficult issue I can see, this is not a UK case, any country, the problem of overlapping institutions or different jurisdictional boundaries. There's often a, you know, if you have something or somewhere which is relatively strong, why would they cooperate with a weaker place? Now, in terms of things like uh, local enterprises, areas and things like that, local economic, 
economic partnerships. I don't know because I haven't spent in a, I, I don't really have an opinion on it at the moment because I haven't really spent a great deal of time thinking about it. As I say, I just really, just recently, just skipping through the documentation because I, I've been focused on the European case. The difficult issue is how do you get the right architectures, the right levels of cooperation for the policy? At the moment, it's not clear to me from the documents how that is going to be achieved. Um, so, you know, obviously, I'm, I'm keenly awaiting what are the documentation comes out. But this is the, the, always a difficult of cross-jurisdictional issues. How do you get people to cooperate in the mutual interest without getting a gaming type scenario where you get boundary problems? And this is also the case to think differently about different types of policies. So one of the things I, as I say, many people say oh, functional urban regions, that's what counts. Well. If I can tell you data from the Netherlands says that that is not true. The polycentric case of the cities of the Randstad. If you are talking about high skilled workers, then it is a polycentric structure. It is a functional region of the big four cities. Den Haag, Rotterdam, Amsterdam, Utrecht. If you're talking about medium skills, they are four polar separate places. There is no functional urban region which, back, which crosses those boundaries. So depending on what policy objectives are, you have to think differently. So what we need to think about in the UK case and also in other countries is how do you work out a kind of an institutional solution that allows for flexibility? My, my, my counterfactual point as an academic would be if you always have the same policy architecture dealing with all the policies it's probably wrong because the externalities we know the spillover effects interactions are different for di different types of activities for different sectors for different institutions for different operations and so on so how do we do that and I think that is a big challenge not just in the UK but in many other countries because political logic to jurisdictions and policy logic to do with the mechanics are often not the same thing. And I think that's the big focus and I think people, uh, civil servants in the UK, policy makers in the UK, um, think tanks, academics, this is really the issue to think about. And vertical coordination, so let's say a neighbourhood type issue. You want to have a multi-sectoral attack at that neighbourhood issue with also a vertical governance integration facility. It's like drilling down deep. But you have to bring all the arsenal of weapons to bear on that. That would be one type of issue. But many other issues which are just as important are cross-jurisdictional between places. And this is very difficult where you've got places which previously are not used to working together. So I do a lot of work in the Netherlands talking to the provinces which are trying to come together, particularly the north of the Netherlands where I live, the provinces in the north of the north of Netherlands are coming together because they realize they've got more in common than they're having competition between each other. And they're also looking at corridor linkages with parts of northwest Germany, places like Bremen. Because if you're talking about energy and environment, it doesn't make any sense for the individual Dutch provinces, which are about the same as English counties in size, population and area, to have separate agendas. It doesn't make much sense, really. But they have to think about how do they coordinate and cooperate in different types of policies, depending on the intention of the policy. That's the issue. How we get there is, I think, still to be seen. Uh, let's collect two, three questions. Please say who you are. So one there, two, three, and then here. This is going to be an impossible mission. <laughs> OK. so. My name is Davide. Uh, I'm a student from the geography department. Uh, well, actually, I have two questions. I will decide the first one. Um, OK, um, what is, the, in, your, in your opinion, what's the scope for multi-level governance in cases where it's known that uh, at regional and local levels there is a lack of administrative capacities? So uh, there is. Uh, and this is uh, this discourse very well known for Southern Europe, where there are collusive networks, or where there is a difficulty in in coping with these kind of uh, approaches. Somebody else here? Yeah. Um, 
I'm Jiang Son. I'm teaching a partless group planning UCL. Uh, my question is partly answered at the beginning of your uh, your presentation, but I couldn't completely get it. So, uh, so you pointed out that uh, the regional policy issues are becoming more similar across countries and across continent. But to me, those agendas are so general and so comprehensive. It's very difficult to be different. So can you explain uh, what kind of other issues that you could have, although we don't have? OK, the, the third uh, question <laughs> here. Hello, I'm Ra. I'm C1F student. Um, I don't know about the ERGF, but for example, for the European Social Fund, each member state has to define its own uh, redistribution system and management. And I was wondering if, you, if the European Union is trying to evaluate the role of the institutional framework in the efficiency of the funds. Uh, like, it's very different, I mean, specific trends like decentralization, uh, it al always depends on the national context. Phil, try to have short answer for everybody yep. because there are other 300 people. <laughs> um, the issue about institutional capacity, um, the reforms are precisely, one of the aspects of the reforms is pre precisely to promote it. And the institutional capacity is not just an issue in Romania, it's also an issue in many of the Western European countries. For example, there is a lot of data out there that academics are familiar with which are never mentioned in programming documents. They're not part of the policy design. There's ma many countries, regions in very advanced parts of Europe that have no baselines. How do you know that you're sex successful or otherwise if you, you don't have a starting position that you're trying to move from? There are no explicit outcomes which are targeted ex ante. So the issue about capacity building is about a change in culture. You are right, in some parts of Europe there will, there will be fewer people, fewer governance capacity and capability to, to carry out those actions, but of course part of the policy and program design will be to build that in, that expertise as actually a learning process and sharing. So the technical assistance aspects of this, of learning, are actually extremely important. But of course you have to start. I mean, if you don't have the institutional capacity, you have to start learning. Institutional capacity is something which also develops. So the partnership issue between the Commission and the Member States is also very much about fostering learning. And at the moment, there isn't really a common platform for that. This is part of the issue. In terms of the issue about being too general, the emphasis of the OECD, the European Commission, the United States, and so on, is that it's not a list of everything which is possible. It's about that all three dimensions always have to be taken together. And that is actually a very difficult thing to do. It's not a general thing that's just a list. Actually, when you sit down and you think about designing a program, that all three dimensions of inclusivity, or sustainability, and knowledge are actually in the program, intentions and outcomes, the monitoring, the evaluation, the outcome indicators. It's actually, that's something that really focuses the mind. So I would say it's not a generality, because a generality is not a challenge. I would say it's the opposite. I would say it's a real challenge. And I do have s some experience in, in working in development programs. This is a real challenge. And uh, in terms of the capacity issue, it's the same thing there. And of course, Fabrizio Barca, as you know, is Italy. And the south of Italy has always been one of the areas he's been most focused on because of his role in the ministry. But this is more general. It's about learning, developing expertise and ability. And it's something that's going to take a long time. This is the start of a long process. It's the first real fundamental change in the policy in 20 years. And many of the countries are following what's happening in Europe, including many of the BRICS countries the people followed in terms of the Place Blind World Development Report, they are keenly connected with the developments in both the European Union and the OECD. Um, the issue about, the final question about the, are the Commission going to evaluate the architecture? No. 
The, com the Commission has no legitimacy to do that and would never, that would never be an intention. That's not what evaluation's about. Evaluation is you design a policy, you make clear your intentions, what you're trying to do, why you're trying to do it, why is it the priority, you try to put together the best policy you can to deal with the, the difficult nuts that you have to crack, you have a team involved, you make it transparent from the start, and the evaluation process starts from day one. You're self-evaluating all the time and sharing. That's the idea. It's not that the Commission is going to evaluate you. That's not going to happen. And the Commission is not going to evaluate the architecture. Architectures are different in every country for every policy system. In some countries, there are multiple architectures, including the United Kingdom, of course. But countries such as Spain, Austria, Germany are, are very complex, decentralized countries. Evaluation of the architecture is not the issue. It's finding a way to foster the right type of institutional and governance innovations given the geographical context and given the institutional architecture. That's the idea. Okay, there are too many questions. One there, two there. Um, Frederick Guy, Brookbeck College. Uh, I, so it seems to me there's a, there's a tension between this capacity building and the, uh, the functional versus administrative units. Uh, it goes back to the first question from, from Newcastle. Uh, you, if you're taking each problem and trying to identify the appropriate unit, the appropriate level, uh, there's no fixed point except the center. And it seems to me that this is, at base, very centralized thinking, if at the risk of being a little unkind, trying to masquerade as federalist thinking. That, that, that the, uh, and where, how, are you, how are you actually going to build this capacity? Uh, the, the, um, the performance targets that you're talking about, the performance, or I shouldn't say targets, you didn't say targets, measures, but it's hard to see how the measures are not going to be targets. And I think uh, if you look at the history of public administration in this country in recent years, the, the, uh, the degradation of subnational administrative units combined with centralized targets in the name of decentralization is a, is a familiar one that, that should perhaps be uh, some, something, you know, not, not the best model. You talk a lot about Roderick. Roderick is, in his development policy work, or his uh, industrial policy work, essentially packaging the experience of, of, of South Korea and Taiwan, where you had, and this is especially important for the, the combination of the performance targets and the willingness to fail, where you have had, where you had very centralized decision making. So you had people who could gamble, could gamble on failure, and I don't see that in the architecture you're talking about. At least I haven't, haven't seen it up here. Okay. Ian, and then there, yeah. Ian Gordon, uh, Geography Department here. Really fascinating. The, the critique of, of existing European regional policies from you and Seems to, be, from, seems, seems to me to have two dimensions to it, one of which is technical intellectual, misunderstandings, inadequate information, and so on, one of which is fundamentally political, political economy. And you were quoting, I think, Barker in talking about uh, the grabbing of power by local elites, or particular local, the capture of policy by particular local elites. So my question really is, well, where's the muscle in the new architecture? I mean, architecture actually doesn't have a muscle. It's another intellectual thinking about it. What is there about the use of indicators and the design of sophisticated forms of governance which will actually undermine the political forces which really explain a large part of the way in which the European regional policy has gone? There was a student there. Hi, um, my question is also about the um, sophistication and the architecture of the policies. Um, you mentioned uh, measurements and evaluation as a core part of this. I think that's very important. But how flexible would these policies be? 
in terms of reacting to the um, results? I mean, how easily can they be changed if the results of these policies are negative? Because I feel like in a lot of other places aside from Europe, there's a lot of policies that aren't working, but they're not changing easily because it's already too, I mean, it's quite deep into the system already. So, yeah, I don't know, how flexible are they? Okay, short answer again, so we can have another slot. Okay. <laughs> Well, actually, all, all three questions have a common, they're different, different takes on, on a, a similar type of issue. The, the question about the UK case in particular, it's more general, but you, fo you focused on the US and particularly the UK's, UK case. Of course, working with the European Commission, your starting point is you've got enormous variety. You know, what, what you see in the UK, you see something completely different in another country. You have big countries which are centralized in general, such as England or France. You have big countries which are decentralized like Germany or Spain. You have small countries which are centralized like the Netherlands. You have small countries which are federal countries like Belgium. You have small, highly decentralized countries like Austria. I mean, you've got every combination possible. Of course, part of it is to try, that's the reality. So it's not about the political economy in the UK or even in the US. It, it's about a much more diverse context. So it's not centralization masking as federalism. It's not that. It's a response to the fact that you have a policy which is very, very well accounted for in terms of the euro spent, what the money's, in terms of an accounting system, extremely well spent. And it is the world's biggest development policy, at least with a common architecture. But if you go to the question, why are we doing that in that country, it's very hard to answer that question. And if money is being provided, then at least as a minimum, that question at least should be answered from the start and ongoing. What authority does the Commission have? The authority of the Commission, in a sense, is really the moral suasion argument. Now, that might sound airy-fairy to some people, but, of course, moral suasion is important. The stiglitz Fatusi Commission is about changing what people see as priorities. Why? Because there's real issues at stake. It's about politics and governance. It's about changing discourses. It's about changing perceptions. And of course, anything of a political economy nature, this relates to this question, of course has to be in that space. It's not an intellectual exercise. It's an exercise which has also come from a huge amount of political input from governance people all over the European Union. It's not just a bunch of economic geographers who came up with these ideas. That's absolutely not the case. The World Bank are involved, the OECD are involved, but also many governance people at very, very high levels um, have been involved. And it is about the real political economy in the European context. The ideas of transparency, results indicators, monitoring, evaluation, publicity is precisely that moral suasion issue. In the end, politicians and decision makers will respond to publicity. Whether they're going to respond perfectly or not is a different issue. But if you make that systematic in the programs and in the policies, then slowly that will lead to a change in culture. That is the idea of the reforms. That's what it's about. But you're starting from a policy which didn't have these features, programming, partnership, and additionality. This goes back to the 19, late 1980s. But actually, can you see it? Well, you can see it, but you have to read all the evaluation documents after the programming period is finished. And how many people are going to read 1,000 pages? Actually, it's more than that. I'd say it's about 3,000 pages of evaluation documents. Actually, I've read them because I have them on my shelf. I have to read them. But how many people here have read them? Nobody. So the idea is to develop an ongoing process and to learn to share best practice. It's about transparency. Of course it is. Um, and this is also the issue about responsiveness to change, is that 
you know, we have a theory of change in our particular region, our context. We think this is the issue, this is the key problem we want to try and attack. We're going to put together a program, a project, a set of policies that are going to deal with this in this particular integrated manner. We're going to try and pull funding resources, da 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 da. You want people to the best of their ability to take the best advice to try and come up with the most reasonable policies. And I, I listed the principles also in terms of indicators and all of that. There are clear principles about how you would do this. Having done that, things will still be different. Reality is different. Things change. But at least if you're able to see the changes, you're in a better situation to adjust or adapt. If you don't have the information coming and you're not monitoring, you're accounting but not evaluating monitoring, then no one's going to change anyway. You just see the policy through. Absorption. You spend the money. And then at the end, you kind of look back and think, was it a good idea or not? Which has been the policy. But actually, that's been most development policies worldwide. And I go back to this point about changing culture. Even Japan is changing dramatically. I was in Japan working, doing some work last year with the European Commission. And I spent a lot of time myself in Japan. Japanese are actually very forward-looking on these things. Very, very forward-looking to a Westerner, a very technocratic, top-down, hierarchical culture. That's how Westerners look at it. Tremendous dynamism in Japan in terms of thinking about these issues. Why? They face an aging society. They have enormous environmental concerns. And of course, more recently, they had the tsunami. Korea is another country. Very much involved in the smart specialization agenda at the OECD very forward-looking, much more forward-looking in some ways than some European countries. You'd be surprised. Brazil is another one. It's not always the usual suspects. And one of the things I would say in terms of the European Commission, there's been an enormous consensus around this. This is not just Commissioner Hahn. Involved in the construction of the new programming documents, the, the new um, proposals for the regulations, and also some of the new policy dimensions such as the smart specialization agenda in the innovation field. DG Employment, DG Radio, DG Information Society, DG Energy, DG Mare, DG Ag, all involved. It's the commissioners from all the different directorates coming together, common platforms, common signatories on these documents. Why? Because there's, even within the European case in the Commission, there's a realization that we have to work across the, the traditional boundaries. And of course, those commissioners represent different countries. That thinking is spreading. I've been in a lot of the Polish meetings until very recently with the Polish presidency. What I would say is, is quite remarkable, the groundswell of opinion. The number of policymakers have been saying, we've been waiting for this for years, at many levels of government, from top level down to regional and local. Unfortunately, we have to finish here, although I have many other, myself included, many other questions. So anyway, thank you really very much, Phil. And